And let's get started straight away with some introductions. Uh, next slide, please, Duncan. So I'm Claire Waller. I'm a senior hydrologist in the Environment Agency's National Flood Hydrology Team. And along with my colleague, Donna Wilson, we are the technical leads for operational flood hydrology at the Environment Agency. Our team's remit includes post-event analysis of recent floods, we review hydrology calculations in environment agency projects and flood risk assessments. We support research and development into flood hydrology methods. And we are also responsible for setting environment agency standards and guidance on flood hydrology, including our flood estimation guidelines. I've been with the environment agency for about 18 months. And before that, I worked in various consultancies, um, including Stantec, Peter Brett Associates and Jacobs and Helcro. And uh, I'm based in East Anglia, so my favourite rivers are perfectly straight, preferably pumped, and ideally raised at least a metre above the surrounding ground level. Next slide, please, Duncan. Right, shall I introduce myself then, rather than you doing it, Claire? Um, I'm Duncan Faulkner, uh, Head of Hydrology at JBA. Um, and... Uh, I'm based near Skipton, which is JBA's head office. And unlike those of you in the south of England who are enjoying lovely sunny weather today, it's um, it's been raining already here today. I think our, our dry spell is well and truly over. So um, I couldn't find a photograph of myself on a permeable catchment, so I went for the opposite extreme. Here I am um, at the site of the uh, UK record daily rainfall up at Honister Pass in the Lake District in a, a bay much the opposite end of the permeability scale. Uh, but I do rather like uh, highly permeable catchments, unpumped catchments, and, and indeed all sorts of rivers. Um, so yeah, the full, the full range is, is, is good for me. And I've been working on issues in relation to permeable catchments for quite a long time, as, as I'll say, once I get to my bit of the talk. Thank you. So we're going to start with some background on why we commissioned this project. So I mentioned that part of our team's role is to get involved in supporting flood estimates for the environment agencies modeling and mapping projects and especially the more complex and problematic catchments tend to get referred on to our team and we found last year that we were looking at a large number of modeling studies being done in groundwater dominated catchments where our standard FEH methods were just not performing very well at all. So one of those was the uh, WANDL in South London and this image from the NRFA website shows the Wandles geology, the watercourse um, flows in a northwards direction and the green colour on there shows the highly permeable bedrock which in this case is chalk and the groundwater in that chalk um, actually drains away from the topographic catchment so you have an effective drainage area here that's um, estimated as, as just less than a third of that whole catchment area that's shown there. And although the Wandle does have some gauges, such as the one shown here, um, the data quality is generally quite poor at these gauges. So this, this station actually drowns and is bypassed um, during high flows. Next slide, please. Um, lower parts of the Wandle, also being in London, are very heavily urbanised. And so you end up with this um, time series of data where you have a very flashy urbanized response that's superimposed over the um, seasonal base flow signal beneath it. Um, this image of gauge daily flow is also taken from the NRFA website. And we were finding that our standard methods for flood estimation were just really struggling to um, reproduce this complex behavior. Next slide, please. More generally, we were having a number of queries in our team um, around pooling group composition. So the improved FEH statistical method um, defines pooling groups uh, without using um, any explicit consideration of uh, geology or permeability when trying to identify catchments similar to the subject site for inclusion in that pooling group. And this was because the R&D project um, that developed those methods showed that um, when it was looking at it at the time, permeability was not a significant factor in terms of identifying similar flood growth curves. But this means you end up with pooling groups like the one shown here. This image is taken from um, WinFAP uh, software. 
and the subject site is shown as that X along the bottom axis with a BFI host value of just over 0.3, which indicates it's really quite an impermeable catchment. Um, the black circles show the um, sites that have been included in the pooling group from the whole distribution of sites available, which is what that sort of histogram shape um, shows you in the background. So there are four sites included in this pooling group that are highly permeable. They've got BFI host values um, greater than 0.8. And the question then is, what do we do with those um, sites when we come to review the pooling group? Some people may choose to remove them because they think they aren't representative of the subject site. Others might leave them in, but perhaps consider using a permeable adjustment method um, to manage the issue of non-flood years. And Duncan will talk more about this later, but the permeable adjustment method isn't particularly straightforward to apply. It's not integrated in WinFAP and it doesn't allow you at the moment to um, use methods such as the enhanced single site pooling group method. Um, or use distributions other than the generalized logistic. Next slide, please. So all of these concerns and more made us um, really want to take a bit of a step back and think about flood estimation methods in groundwater dominated catchments. So we commissioned JBA to undertake this review and the scope of the project included what and where are groundwater dominated catchments? What are the flood generating processes in those catchments? Um, what case studies we have available for um, flood events and also recent modelling studies which have attempted to uh, represent these flood generating processes. What are the challenges for methods generally in these catchments? And then looking more specifically at the performance of FEH methods in these catchments. Um, what alternative methods are available for us to potentially use instead? And finally, to make some recommendations for current practice and further research. Next slide, please. Right, I think it's over to me now. Thank you, Claire. When I heard about this project, I had a bit of a feeling of deja vu because I felt I might have done it already. And sure enough, on my shelves here is a copy of a rather similar report. But it's from 25 years ago, way back when report covers had fax numbers on the front rather than website addresses a review of flood frequency estimation on permeable catchments uh, carried out uh, by the Institute of Hydrology back when I was working there. Um, but things have changed a lot in the last 25 years, and it was interesting to, to see during this more recent project that some of what we thought back then has been turned, over, turned on its head, really, with more recent evidence. So first thing to talk about is terminology. I don't really like the term permeable catchment because all catchments, to my mind, are permeable, whether they're full of limestone pavement, like the one on the left, or whether they've got water visibly flowing over the ground surface, like the one on the right, which is Calderdale. Uh, so unless you cover a catchment in cling film, it is permeable. And so for that reason, we uh, recommended a change in terminology to talk about groundwater dominated catchments, rather than this sort of promoting this or perpetuating this, this sort of mythical classification of permeable and not permeable catchments. So a groundwater dominated catchment um, is one where most of the flow in the river is coming from groundwater sources. And Claire mentioned that the BFI host catchment descriptor, which is a, a surrogate for the gauged base flow index. And we recommended a threshold where if um, at least twice as much of the river flow is coming from groundwater, then we'd class that as groundwater dominated. So that works out as a, a BFI threshold of 0.66. So anything above that is classed as groundwater dominated. And it's really about the difference between elephants and goldfish. So everyone knows that elephants have very long memories. Um, and goldfish can't remember anything for more than a few minutes. I don't know how people actually measure this. And you can see that on this plot here of, of hydrographs for two very contrasting rivers. So the red um, is the flow on the River Meon in Hampshire, a very chalk dominated catchment. And this is about two years worth of flow data. So you can see that annual signal in the hydrograph, um, very pronounced base flow response. And then the other one in blue is a very impermeable catchment, is actually an island, um, upland area, um, a very rapid response. Every time it rains, the water is up and down again very quickly, a bit like a, a goldfish in terms of its hydrological memory. And 
you can actually see that sort of seasonal base flow type signal. Um, again, here the red is the river Meon, but you can also see it on catchments where uh, water is stored on the surface rather than subsurface like it is in chalk catchments. It's all about storage really. So uh, the, the brown hydrograph here is for another catchment, um, not at all base flow dominated, but it's one with a very large lake storage in. Uh, so on the left there we've got the Mion, on the right it's a, a catchment again in the west of Ireland actually looking very very different mountainous but it's got huge volumes of storage and it's all about that storage really is what's causing this um this very sort of sluggish uh, slow response to rainfall. So where are these groundwater dominated catchments? Um, about 19% of gauge catchments in the UK fall over that threshold of, of BFI values. And they are nearly all in England, particularly in the south and the east of England, as you can see on this map here. So the blue dots there are catchments um, on the FEH drainage network where the BFI host exceeds 0.66. Um, and then some of the colours in the background are showing you different uh, geological outcrops. So it's particularly about the chalk, the blue outcrop there, which goes all the way down the east of England, through the Yorkshire Worlds, Lincolnshire, into Norfolk, and then um, all the way down into Hampshire, and also forming the North and the South Downs. And most of the catchments that fall within that outcrop or nearby are groundwater dominated. Where they're not, it's normally because there's some drift cover um, over the chalk. But we're also seeing some of these catchments in other geological formations, for instance, the Olytic limestone, um, some areas of the Permatriassic sandstone, although that's, that's not as highly uh, groundwater dominated. And there are a few little interesting features on this map as well. So, for instance, in the fens here in East Anglia in Lincolnshire, there's a fair number of catchments there which are falling over that threshold, despite not being on any of these, these sort of classic um, highly permeable um, aquifers and there could be issues there about uh, drainage and classification of soil types and so on. So a lot of it is about chalk and chalk's uh, a very important aquifer in the UK and because its outcrops are large it means that many catchments can be completely composed of chalk which tends to make them very much dominated by groundwater influences. Chalk has quite a low specific yield, which means it tends to respond quite rapidly to recharge over a single winter season, uh, which means perhaps more potential for, for driving fluvial flooding. And also for the, the formations of chalk can be quite thick, so 100 to 400 metres uh, depth under outcrop, although most of the flow processes are happening in the very upper part of the aquifer. And um, Chalk is associated with class one in the host soil classification, which has a very high value of BFI. Um, you may be aware that the catchment descriptor BFI host has recently been replaced by another one called BFI host 19, uh, which makes some differences, but no matter which one you pick, then, then chalk comes out as a very high value. Should emphasize as well that this catchment is, is not about sorry, this project is not about groundwater flooding per se, it's about fluvial flooding on catchments that are influenced by groundwater. So there's a bit of a, a subtle distinction there. And as you might expect, uh, high values of BFI host are linked to some other catchment descriptors as well, particularly annual average rainfall. So here we're separating out um, all the uh, gauge catchments in the UK according to whether they're under or over that threshold of BFI host. And you can see the ones that are over it, that are groundwater dominated, are very much lower rainfall than the others. And so it can be a little bit difficult to disentangle effects. You know, is the catchment behaving in a particular way because it's groundwater dominated or because it's also low rainfall or whatever else you might expect. So how do floods happen on these groundwater dominated catchments? Well, we've identified a few processes. Um, there's some source material here from the earlier report I showed you, and also from the program of lowland catchment research, LOCAR, that was done a few years ago, which put in some pretty dense instrumentation to some lowland chalk catchments, such as the Pang. Uh, 
So one of the processes is flash flooding. This is all about what happens at the ground surface. Can the rain actually get into the soil and, and uh, infiltrate, recharge into the aquifer? If it can't, it doesn't really matter you know, how um, highly permeable the subsoils and the aquifer might be, you're going to get runoff happening. So this tends to be sort of flash floods on steep slopes during intense rainfall. At the opposite end of the time scale, you've got prolonged winter rainfall, which might lead to um, recharge uh, unusually high groundwater tables, and that will lead to base flow dominated floods. But you can get mixtures as well. So for instance, you might have a high groundwater table followed by an extra burst of rain, which leads to quite a rapid response in um, near surface uh, fissured zones, with it, particularly with chalk aquifers. And I've got a bit more about that on the next slide. And then there's cast flooding as well, which is a bit of a special case. Um, in some ways, cast catchments behave a little bit more like low permeability ones. Um, but cast is very common, not just in limestone. Cast features are very common in chalk as well. Um, and so we thought it was helpful to include cast flooding in this catchment. One thing these sketches don't show is the really important role of the sort of spatial layout of geology in the catchment. So for instance, you might have catchments that are a mixture of geological types. There might be some drift cover in the upper parts of the catchment where you, which, you know, maybe they're low permeability areas that produce runoff and then that water then could subsequently infiltrate as it finds its way down, down the system. So the spatial layout of soils and geology can be really important to determine the response of a catchment. So I talked about these, the role of this near surface fissured zone. And just as an example of its importance, this is an illustration of it on the river Lavant in Sussex near Chichester. So, We've got a graph here that's going to compare annual maximum groundwater levels um, with annual maximum flows in the river that flows over the aquifer. And the ground level at this borehole uh, at Chilgrove is 77 metres above sea level. And about the top seven metres of the aquifer is a zone of very high uh, transmissivity. Uh, and that's because uh, of these uh, fissures that tend to develop in the in the sort of near surface zone where the water table has historically been fluctuating. And here's the comparison between on your maximum groundwater level and on your maximum flow. So you can see once the groundwater level exceeds that threshold of 70 meters, you get a sudden surge in the river flow. And essentially the catchment starts to behave a little bit more like a low permeability catchment with rapid runoff processes. So these fissured zones, I mentioned they tend to occur in the uh, near surface zone where the water table has been um, fluctuating. And that includes uh, periglacial peri periods where you had higher water tables than you do presently. And it's those sorts of processes that have, to, that have developed these shallow zones of very high transmissivity in chalk aquifers. <coughs> And they tend to develop particularly along valley axes where you've got areas of structural complexity in the geology, so synclines, anticlines, faults, and so on. And the chalk in the southern counties of England tends to be more structurally complex than it is further north because it's been influenced by alpine tectonic processes. And so you might expect that um, in these southern counties, in uh, rivers that flow over the aquifers towards the south of England, you've got some evidence of more variability in annual maximum flows because uh, in years where the water table gets unusually high and flows into the, uh, this fissured zone, then you might have much more rapid runoff and therefore more extreme floods. And there's just a bit of a hint of that in the data. If you look at the, um, it is the a map here of the coefficient of variation, so a measure of the variability of annual maximum flows uh, on groundwater dominated catchments. And you can see some of the highest values there are in the far, far south of England. So just a, a bit of a sort of hint of some geographical differences really caused by underlying um, geological structures. 
So some examples then of real events that have happened in these catchments. Oh, I should say just one thing about mixed processes as well. This is an example where you've got um, a little bit like the Wandle that Claire mentioned earlier on, where you've got a base flow series with these rapid flashy responses superimposed. Um, this is an entirely rural catchment. It's the River Way in Dorset. Um, and you could speculate as to what's causing these rapid responses. Um, it's not from urban areas because there aren't any. Um, if you notice, look at this graph, then all the big uh, spikes tend to be happening at times when the base flow is also high. So it's probably something to do with near surface uh, high conductivity or perhaps um, runoff from the riparian area of the river. So here's an example, sticking with the river way again, of a flash flood. This was an event that happened back in July 1955. Um, for many decades subsequently, this was the highest daily rainfall recorded in the UK. And the official total was 280 millimetres, although there was an unofficial measurement in the bucket, more like about 355 millimetres. It had been a dry summer, so uh, base flow wasn't particularly high, groundwater table wasn't high, and then we had about four hours of rain at about 50 millimetres per hour. Uh, very steep catchment, um, and so it swept away cars, caravans, pigs, hen, um, hen houses, and one person drowned in that event. An example of a base flow dominated flood. Um, well, here's a, a scanned copy of the, the second ever copy of the uh, circulation magazine that I had, having joined BHS back in, in 1993. In early 94, this was the headline in circulation about the dry valleys striking back with an article by Terry Marsh, I think it was, about this very prolonged flood that happened on the River Lavant at Chichester. And uh, a few years later, in December 2000, there was a similar event. Um, Long-term travel disruption from events like this. An example of a karst flood would be on the River Yeo at Cheddar. Um, although karst catchments are more, probably more, a bit more like Emmental than Cheddar because they're full of riddled with holes and, and tubes and caves. Uh, so this is a flood um, in July 68, um, where again, we had about rain over four hours, estimated return period being about a thousand years. Um, and normally, the flow processes are underground, but in this event, the swallow holes were overwhelmed, runoff uh, occurred over the ground surface um, and caused devastation, really, in the village of Cheddar. So it is worth emphasising that floods on these groundwater dominated catchments can, can, can kill people. Again, uh, there was a fatality in this event here. So they're not just a sort of slow responding events like you might associate with base flow dominated catchments. So we were trying to sort of sum up what the what some of the issues are with estimating floods on these catchments. And Claire mentioned there are Wandle at Wimbledon Common. So I bring you the Wombles of Wimbledon Common because it's all about the balance between underground and overground flow processes and how those change between catchments and how they change between events. And we picked out five manifestations of this same set of problems, which are difficulty in determining the contributing area, changes in flow processes between small and large floods, ephemeral streams, annual maximum flows that aren't real floods, and long-lasting floods. We don't have time to go through all of those in any great detail, but I'll, I'll talk you through some of them. Starting off with this question of what is the contributing area? Because as hydrologists, we're used to thinking of catchment areas as a fairly fixed property, but they can, they can be anything but on groundwater dominated catchments. So to take the, um, the Cheddar example again, this is a map here. Uh, the red line is the catchment boundary of the River Yeo at Cheddar. It's the topographic boundary, but in fact, in the southeastern part of the catchment there, there are several swallow holes, which are these blue features here around the village of Priddy, which actually capture the flow and take it off to the south, out of the topographic catchment, and it emerges at Wookie Hole Caves to the south there. Um, so there's about, what, 20-25% of the catchment that's excluded uh, from uh, contributing to the flow at Cheddar. 
But it's possible that during extreme events, if those swallow holes, um, their capacity gets exceeded, then the flow will start to follow the topographic catchment. And so you'll have catchment area that depends on the intensity of the rainfall and the antecedent conditions. And that brings me on to one of the one of the really important findings for this project, I think, and not unique to this project by any means, which is the importance of understanding physical processes. It's always important in hydrology, but um, never more so, I think, than, than on catchments like this. So here is, is my attempt to understand the physical processes uh, for flood generation and the yo catchment. So it's a, a sort of a notional cross section here. We, uh, we've got four processes identified here. Number one being runoff from uh, lower permeability upland areas of the catchment, which then enters the swallow holes and emerges at a spring. Number two is more diffuse infiltration into the aquifer. Number three is in exceptional events over land runoff. And number four over on the right hand side here is the one I already mentioned where the swallow holes that normally take flow out of the catchment might stop doing so. And then there are other ways in which processes can change between small and large floods. And an example of that would be on the River Ludd in, uh, at Louth in Lincolnshire. Here's an annual maximum flow series up to the mid 2000s. And you can see most years the flood was peaking between about two and four or five QMEX. 2007 though saw a much higher event up at about 14 or 15 QMEX. Um, and so if all you had was that, the annual maximum flow series, and you had to sort of estimate what the 100 year return period was, you could apply various techniques and um, I haven't attempted it, but you might find, I don't know, 20, 30 QMEX, something like that. Um, you probably wouldn't be expecting a flood like this one to occur though. Um, back in 1920, there was a flood which goes off the scale of this graph. You can see a picture of its impact. Um, the peak flow has been estimated by various sources at anything from about 140 to 170 QMEX. So it is, it's clearly a, a radical transformation in the process of runoff generation in compare, comparison with what happens most years. And this flood uh, killed uh, many people. It was you know, a truly devastating flash flood on this normally groundwater dominated catchments. It seemed like, um, once the rainfall intensity reached a certain value, the catchment suddenly flipped behaviour and became uh, you know, a catchment dominated by surface runoff. So I think one lesson from this is that long, ignore, ignoring longer term flood history can be, can be literally fatal in some cases. It also means it's rather difficult to justify fitting a single frequency distribution to two very different processes. And there's some evidence, if you look at a national data set of, uh, of peak flows, this separates out the, again, the coefficient of variation. So a measure of the spread of floods, it separates them out into two populations uh, under and over that BFI host threshold. And you can see there's a distinctive difference here. It is statistically significant. So we've got our groundwater dominated catchments showing higher values of LCV which has interesting implications for the problem that well, the question that Claire mentioned earlier on about whether you should account for BFI or other measures of soils or geology when you're deciding how to group catchments for the purpose of creating flood growth curves. Ephemeral streams is another issue. Again, it's a, a sort of more extreme case than some of the ones we've already talked about, and I won't dwell on that further in this, in this talk. Because I want to get onto this one the issue of annual maximum flows that are not floods. Around about 4% of all annual maximum flows in the NRFA peak flows data set are under half of QMED. In other words, they're quite small and potentially not classifiable as floods. And those sorts of low flows do tend to happen more often on high BFI catchments, but in particular, they happen on low rainfall catchments. So here we've got a graph here, value maximum flow again, uh, divided by QMED. And each dot here is one flood on one gauged catchment. 
and I've drawn the horizontal line here to show the threshold of half of QMED. So you can see it is almost exclusively the low rainfall catchments where this is happening. There's one exception up here, which is a catchment at the outlet of a reservoir. It's, it's not a natural flow regime. There is also a link with BFI. So we've got the yellow values there showing high BFI hosts. But in particular, it's, it's a, an arid catchment phenomenon, really, rather than a highly uh, permeable catchment phenomenon which makes intuitive sense. You'd expect low rainfall catchments to be able to build up high soil moisture deficits in some years and therefore not to produce much runoff all year. So there's this thing called the permeable adjustment, um, which was developed as part of the FEH research. Um, I was involved in developing it and I feel a bit embarrassed now that it's even called the permeable adjustment because um, I think that's a bit of a misnomer and can cause it can give some people a false sense of security uh, in that they may be tempted to think because they've applied this adjustment, they've dealt with the problems caused by groundwater dominated catchments. And that's, that's far from being the case. So if you're not familiar with it, the adjustment works by fitting a conditional generalized logistic growth curve, only looking at years with floods in, so ignoring all the ones below half of QMED. And then you make, you make an adjustment to, so that, that growth curve becomes applicable to the whole set of years. Um, you then calculate equivalent L moments for that adjusted growth curve if you want to include it as part of a pooled analysis. And the effect it has, here's a couple of examples. The effect is pretty minimal, really, usually. So we've got the um, black one being before adjustment and the red curve being after adjustment. And you can see below this threshold here, those are the floods that have been excluded from the adjusted curve. Usually, it doesn't have very much of an effect. Um, if you compare these graphs with their equivalents back in the FEH, um, there was quite a large effect back then. But since then, we've had 25 years more data, and that's made quite a difference. We applied the adjustment to the full NRFA data set and um, this is showing here the ratio of uh, peak flows for the one percent annual exceedance probability and usually it's not changing the peaks by more than about five percent in either direction the report on this project which is freely available does include a review of some alternative types of adjustments and more objective ways of identifying flood free years um, but I think possibly more important than that is to think about the terminology and to realize that this adjustment usually has a minor effect, whereas some other choices that we make in flood frequency estimation can, can have a much larger effect. And then the fifth one, the fifth Womble problem is the issue of long lasting floods. Um, this is a, a graph showing a, a sort of characteristic flood hydrograph shape for the River Lavant at Chichester. Um, derived by averaging the widths of lots of observed hydrographs. And you can see that it's staying above half the peak flow for at least three, if not four weeks on average. And that has all sorts of implications about the, you know, the economic damage of floods being about disruption, um, about uh, you know, whether it's even worth thinking about storage type solutions for floods on groundwater dominated catchments. Uh, and the whole concept really of having a design flood hydrograph possibly for catchments like this, a, a steady state modeling approach might be even more relevant than, a, than an unsteady hydrodynamic one. So in the last part of what I'm going to say, I wanted to just say a little bit about how well flood estimation handbook methods perform on these sorts of catchments. Um, and in particular, how well the statistical method performs at estimating the median annual flood QMED. Uh, so here we go. Here's a graph where we're looking at the proportional error in QMED. So we're dividing the estimated QMED from catchment descriptors by the observed. And you can see there's a real threshold in behavior here at this critical value of BFI hosts. So once we go above that, it seems there's potential for FEH methods to greatly overestimate QMED. Not always, sometimes it's under. Uh, but it tends, does tend to be the overestimation. Now, notice this is a log scale. So, you know, we're talking about overestimation by a factor of 
four, eight, ten, in some cases even more. There's one exception on this graph. There's a point up here. I don't know if my mouse is visible, but there is a, a grey point in the top left-hand part of the graph there, uh, which has quite a low BFI host. So you might think, well, that's that's clearly not a groundwater-dominated catchment. But if you look at it, it actually is. It's just a catchment with a lot of drift cover, but it's in the Yorkshire Dales. It's a catchment with cast headwaters. Um, it's the Hebden Beck, and these are the headwaters of the Hebden Beck. Um, and basically the headwaters get captured by a cave system, by Mossdale Caverns, and disappear out of the topographic catchment, a little bit like the, the Cheddar example. So that's why the QMED is being greatly overpredicted if you use characteristics like catchment area for it. Taken at a national level, uh, this is the, the average bias in estimation of QMED. So you can see, you know, the highly permeable catchments are, are biased to overestimate. And this is the root mean square error. So we're getting almost double the average error on groundwater dominated catchments. And here's a map of these estimation errors. Uh, so the blue symbols are where we're seeing great overestimation of QMED. And they do tend to be associated with the chalk formations. And there's a bit of clustering here. You can see towards the sort of north and uh, west of London around the Chilterns and the Boucher Downs, we've got a cluster of overestimation there. But then we've got other areas, for instance, down in Dorset, where, you know, cheek by jowl, you've got great overestimation and great underestimation. So it becomes really important to look at local circumstances when you're thinking of you know, transferring QMED values from one catchment to a, a neighbour. And also the spatial layer to the geology is important. So this is on the River Lee, um, where QMED at summer gauges in this catchment is overestimated by a factor of 15, interestingly. Um, the Lee doesn't, it doesn't appear as a very high value of BFI host because it's got all these areas of clay with flints, uh, these orange areas on the map. But if you look at the layout of it, they're all in the upland parts of the catchment. And there's ample opportunity for runoff from those areas to then infiltrate as it finds its way down into the valleys that are full of chalk. Um, and you've also got issues with groundwater flowing out of the catchment, as indicated by the arrow there. Right, time is ticking on. Um, this is a rich, an issue that, uh, that Claire raised earlier on about whether to include BFI host in pudding groups or not. Um, and because Claire's already mentioned this, I won't really go through it very much, but just to say that because there are correlations between BFI and rainfall and other cap caption descriptors, just because BFI isn't included doesn't mean it's actually not influencing the, um, the composition of pooling groups in, in a different guise. I think one outstanding question is, though, how you account for the possibility of occasional monster floods, which just aren't there in the gauge records in most chalk catchments, and yet we know can happen, at least in, in some of them. And then I think the final point for me is about the performance of the REFH method. It does show similar performance to the statistical method in terms of peak flows, but more interestingly, I think, is the performance in terms of hydrograph shapes and volumes. So here's a hydrograph predicted by the REFH2 method for a notional high permeability catchment. And the thing I want you to notice there is that the initial base flow, the flow at the start of the event, is zero. So we've got a catchment here that's base flow dominated, and yet REFH2 is predicting a base flow of zero. And it does that because it calculates the base flow on the basis of the initial soil moisture, C and E, um, and that comes out as quite low on catchments like this. But C is the soil moisture in the unsaturated zone, and yet it's being used to predict the base flow, which is a characteristic of the saturated zone. So I think there's potential for improvement there. Right. I've probably spoken for too long, but over to you now, Claire. That's all right. Thank you, Duncan. So I'm just going to run through a few of the recommendations that the report made for current practice, and there's lots more details on these um, in the report itself. So please do go and read that.
Um, the first recommendations were, as, as Duncan has already mentioned, really about taking great care when you're estimating QMED for ungaged catchments. Where possible, seek additional local data. So there may be uh, local low flow gauges that you could use to derive uh, QMED from the flow duration curve, for example. And most importantly, when you're choosing donor catchments, don't just use the default six that WinFAP highlights for you. You really need to be looking at uh, comparing your surrounding catchments, looking at their groundwater flow directions, their water tables, their spatial patterns of geology, and really making a very well-informed decision um, around what donors you're going to use. Next slide, please. So moving on to the statistical um, flood growth curves, again, really prioritize your local flow and level data and wherever possible, seek out extra historical information. That's not just for your gauge catchments, but for your ungaged catchments as well. Um, try and find those monster floods that may have happened 100, 200 years ago. Um, you may want to consider using single site growth curves um, rather than pooled approaches in some cases. And if you are using pooling a group approach, you may want to consider giving priority in the pooling group to other groundwater dominated catchments. Next slide, please. And then thinking about hydrograph shapes and volumes, um, you really need to be considering how sensitive your project outcomes will be to those hydrograph volumes and potentially um, doing a flood frequency analysis for volume as well as peak flows. And you need to be um, really investigating the relative roles of base flow and rapid runoff in your catchment and carefully considering how they might combine in your design event for a uh, specific return period. So you may, as Duncan's indicated, want to consider um, using an empirical analysis of hydrograph shapes from observed data, um, which may give you a more realistic shape um, than uh, a design event rainfall runoff model might do. Next slide, please. And finally, you want to be really open minded um, to be considering alternative methods beyond FEH in some circumstances, um, particularly where there may be combinations of variables um, that lead to a flood hazard that can't be confidently represented by a single design event. So, for example, if you've got mixed geology on your catchment or groundwater, groundwater dominated combined with an urban catchment, for example. So you may want to be con uh, considering continuous simulation methods. There's an example uh, shown on the left there from the continuous simulation study done from the Avon at Salisbury. Um, or you may want to be thinking about joint probability analysis. Um, so for example, you could separate your time series into base flow and rapid runoff components, construct separate flood frequency curves for those components, and then combine them based on a joint probability analysis of both mechanisms occurring at the same time. For example, using a tool such as the multivariate event modeler, which is shown there. You also might want to look at um, outputs from groundwater models, uh, which may be able to generate flow duration curves for you from which QMED could be estimated. And um, forecast uh, catchments, you may want to consider using sewer modeling approaches to represent those rapid underground uh, pathways. Next slide, please. So all these recommendations and more have been incorporated into our latest flood estimation guidelines, which were updated this month. And you can get in touch uh, with the Environment Agency Customer Contact Centre on that email address there to request um, that document, which is LIT11832. Next slide, please. So this review wasn't able to answer all questions. Reviews never really are. There's always more work to be done. And um, a number of recommendations were made for further research. These were grouped into four different work packages. Um, so the first was around uh, some explorations and tests on a small sample of gauge catchments where our standard FEH methods appear to be performing particularly poorly. The second group um, was about extending this analysis to all groundwater dominated catchments and uh, focusing on improving the statistical method for both gauged and ungaged catchments. A third uh, group of recommendations were around tests and refining the VFH2 uh, design event method. And then a final um, group of recommendations around collating information such as historical flood data and complementary evidence like groundwater levels and developing more guidance on some aspects of this, such as um, multivariate methods for these mixed response catchments um, or developing guidance on how to use groundwater models um, or looking at case studies for alternative methods like continuous simulation. Next slide, please. 
So to give you a flavour of some of the more detailed recommendations for uh, and ideas for research um, listed in the report, these will relate to the FEH family of methods. So um, ideas around can we use hydrological contributing area instead of topographic catchment area? Could we reconsider BFI host and BFI values and refine them further, uh, focusing on these highly permeable catchments? Or are there perhaps new descriptors that we could develop that could include perhaps the spatial configuration of geology within the catchment, you know, whether there's drift cover on the high ground versus lower, um, uh, more permeable uh, geology on the lower ground, um, or perhaps the distribution of urban areas within the catchment. Um, we would like to increase our data sample size. So this could be um, adding in temporary flow gauges in catchments where they are particularly uncertain, or even adding in data from gauged uh, catchments in the chalk areas of northern France. All of these things may allow us to improve the QMED equation, um, look more deeply into those reasons for errors, and consider whether we can use um, any of these alternative descriptors, perhaps create a QMED equation specifically for groundwater-dominated dom catchments, and also develop some systematic strategies for donor selection and weighting. It'd be good to have another look at pooling groups. Should BFI host 19 be added back in or not? Should we be removing permeable catchments from pooling groups or not? Um, perhaps we need a, a separate pooling group uh, procedure for groundwater catchments in the same way that WinFAP5 now includes a separate procedure for small catchments. And then finally, um, as Duncan mentioned, um, ideas around looking at the RefH2 model for improve, improving its, its base flow and uh, considering its volumetric performance. Next slide please. slide, please. So we are looking internally within the Environment Agency for funding opportunities to conti uh, continue to progress some of these recommendations, but we are really keen to work with the wider community as well. Um, there may be opportunities here for PhD or master's dissertation topics, um, or perhaps some industry partners would like to get involved in this research. So please do get in touch, and that is our team email um, address on the screen. Next slide, please. So that's it. Um, thank you very much for watching, and I think there's a, a few minutes left over for a few questions. But if you have any further feedback, questions or comments, please do send them to our team email inbox. Thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, uh, Duncan and Claire. We do have a few questions in the in the chat, so I will dive straight in given the time. So, um, the first, I think some of, we've touched a little bit on some of them, um, particularly at the end in the um, thinking about your rec the recommendations and what's needed for future research. But uh, Ian Reid asks, um, the complex geological structure affects groundwater flow net. For example, the northern section of the Yorkshire Walls, where there are many localised flower flow structures, I'm guessing, um, and general dip shifts from the east northeast to the south southwest. How do we take this into account when defining the phreatic catchment? Indeed, is it important when predicting base flow? Perhaps Duncan, one for you, Duncan. Um, I just tempted to say, good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, yes, it does. And um, it can be, I mean, fortunately, we've got, in this country, we've got really good knowledge of hydrogeology, but there's always more to be discovered. Um, and I, I guess the challenge is particularly on, on ungauged catchments, isn't it, or ungauged portions of catchments. Where we've got gauge catchments, then you would hope that a lot of that gets captured in the gauge data. But still, then you have the possibility of, um, of events occurring outside the, the measured range and you know, unexpected things occurring. So yeah, understanding those complexities of structure is really important. Great, thanks, Duncan. Uh, Tracy, um, as, as, as a related question, thinking about the hydrogeology um, and are the large errors in QMED for groundwater catchments, perhaps due to the differences between topographic catchments and the contributing catchments, did you identify any useful data, digital data sets that can be easily used to identify groundwater flow directions, et cetera, which may help identify these issues? Or perhaps this is in the recommendations for future research <laughs> that you had at the end. I'm really glad you asked that, Tracy, because uh, I skipped over my list of reasons for possible overestimation, but that was certainly one of them. Yeah. 
was differences in the catchment. I'm not sure that's the whole story because it sometimes seems to happen that you get a whole cluster of even adjacent catchments all showing overestimation. Whereas you might expect, you know, if the water is leaving one and entering another one, that you know you'll have over and under adjacent, and it doesn't always seems to happen. Um, so I think there's maybe some other areas as well. Perhaps BFI host value is not always being re reflective to the true, the true hydro hydrological response. Perhaps uh, depression in, in groundwater tables due to abstraction. Perhaps even the way the cube metric equation is parameterized. So there's a number of possibilities there, I think. Uh, and no, we didn't really identify any useful digital data sets apart from the uh, the hydrogeological maps, which um, are pretty dated, but they do show some useful groundwater contour information. Thanks, Duncan. Um, I'm going to skip slightly out of order as we had a, a, a related question here from Ben Smith, um, who says, as BFI or BFI host values are calculated on complete time series, such as i.e. high and low flows, are these metrics suitable for identifying groundwater contribution to floods? Or should there be a similar should there be similar similar statistics that are targeted purely at identifying groundwater contributing um, groundwater contributions during peak or flood events? Yeah, so we're thinking about that, isn't it? I mean, I suppose in the original FEH caption descriptors, there was another descriptor, SVR host, which was more targeted at flood events, not specifically for groundwater catchments. Uh, but it wasn't found to be as useful as BFI host and it was harder to measure because it needed rainfall data and good quality high flow data. Um, so there's a bit of a challenge there, but it would be good to have something that was more targeted at, at flood conditions, yeah. Thank you. Um, one here from Rob Sweet who says, for QMED, has any analysis been done using the flow variability linking equation? Um, probably <laughs> not, not as part of this. Um, and let, I can't remember. Maybe we did mention it. Um, I might need to get back to you on that one, Rob. <laughs> okay, thanks. And then um, we have a question here from Nick Everard. I don't know if you're still there, Nick, but as, as your question is quite long in the chat, I wondered if you might want to ask. In I guess class. that's why you were hopping around either side of my question. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, um, thanks. Um, no, I, it's just really, it's kind of my pet point, really. Anytime we're talking about high flows, um, I'm always concerned to understand the accuracy of the peaks that are reported. And what struck me as, as the stations were discussed, I was looking at NRFA um, to see the relationship between the peak flow that's reported and the peak flow that's actually been gauged at the sites. Um, and, you know, for the Wandle, 4.6 is the highest gauging, 40 is reported as the highest flow for, you know, for the way site, 1 versus 5.4. Um, and all of them state that they have issues with bypassing and or drowning. So I just really wanted to push it out there again and, and just ask, you know, are, are efforts being made to try to capture these high flows more effectively than has happened in the past? Yeah, the, as I think, as you, as you know, there's a, a huge um, strand of the flood hydrology roadmap all about data improvements and, and looking at high flow confidence and how we make sure that our confidence in peak flow is fed through into our flood estimation calculations. Um, certainly it is at sort of when we get to the local studies. So thinking of the Wandle, we're very aware of the issues in, and the limitations that the confidence in the high flows has on how we can use that data there. It is a, li a bit harder to um, draw into these sort of larger studies that are taking the data set as a whole. You can't go to that sort of level of site specific analysis. Um, but it, yes, it, you know, it is it is being aware, uh, addressed through other projects that the Flood Hydrology Improvements Programme are actively working on. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are at one o'clock. There are two questions that have just appeared. So I wondered if we could just have quickly um, have those and then we'll, we'll bring it to a close. So um, we have one question that basically is, were the effects of climate change accounted for within the study? Was there consider consideration that more recent data is likely to already being affected by climate change? Oh, that's such a good question. Thank you very much, because um, I deliberately left out 
one of the other Womble problems, which is about non-stationarity, because otherwise I'll still be talking now. But yes, we did look at that, and there is evidence of increases, quite strong statistical evidence of increases in peak flows in some chalk catchments. Whether that's due to effects of climate change on the groundwater table, I don't know, because you know they're sort of quite complex, really. There's a balance there, I suppose, between increased winter rainfall and also increased potential evaporation and the effects of abstraction, but there's certainly some evidence of change, yeah. Great, thanks Duncan. That was uh, from Freak Van um, Arkel. And then the, our final question from Mike Vaughan, uh, do we need to treat monster floods separately with an additional procedure, particularly with ungaged sites and gauged locations without any record of these monster floods? There seems to be a non-statistical element to this and how we'd want to feed it through into scheme des design. I'm waiting for Claire to unmute herself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, Mike. I think um, you know that the Luth uh, catchment where we've, where I think you were involved in looking at this in the past and, and we just couldn't get a, a statistical distribution to fit um, that monster flood. Um, and it was left a little bit almost unfinished in that, you know, we, we had to, I think, exclude that from the statistical analysis and generate design flows based on the more recent floods um, for, for a flood storage scheme, um, whilst acknowledging that this monster flood had happened, um, but not really knowing how, how we estimate its return period, how we include it in scheme design. Is it even possible to mitigate for that size of flood? So, um, yeah, I don't know what the answer is to that, I'm afraid. Uh, one for further research, I'd say. I'll cop out with that. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Duncan and Claire, and all the uh, people who've asked questions and everybody joining today. Um, there was the email address Claire showed at the end of her slides there. Um, if anyone has any further questions, hopefully you made a note of that if you do. Um, 